that's good. I was really getting concerned. That's the low word it was, it was getting. Good to see those who have been absent for some time. Gomer missed last Sabbath. He's back. Good to see him. Vince, it's good to see you back. And uh, our visitors are back with us. It's good for every, to see everyone. We are, we are always wondering what effect our articles in the paper are having, and I'm corresponding with a lady now. Uh, we received a second letter from you, and I uh, told her that I was glad that she was reading the articles in the paper, and this is, I thought maybe you'd be interested in what she had to say. She said, yes, I read the article in the paper every week. Your article is the only one of some of uh, Your article is only one of some. Two pages uh, and, uh, and time, she says, two pages of religious news that has meat in it. So I thought that was a comment that you don't normally hear very often, especially when those who disagree with you. <laughs> and she did. But yet she said, your, your article is the only one that has really has some meat in it. And her name is Gloria Boyd. Red Krebs. I don't know if any of you know, might know her or not. But uh, she appreciates the articles and, and uh, what she wrote about is remember the sermon I there was three or four of them that I gave you concerning the trumpets. And I, I was reminding the people that what they hear from the Bible, from the television, and so forth, and not always the true sound from the scriptures. And I mentioned them, but one of the thoughts about when we die, we're normally taught that we go to heaven. But when she wrote, apparently she agreed with that teaching. She said, I think your trumpet's out of tune. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was kind of cute. <laughs> Your trumpet's out of tune because she didn't think that I was speaking the truth that the Bible teaches. But we're discussing the scriptures and where it will lead, we don't know, but uh, I like to get letters even though they do not always agree. But uh, uh, there's a few of them are really sincere. And this lady seems to be one that will listen, even though she disagrees, will listen. But I've gotten some letters that you can tell her mind is closed. You, they just more or less said that I know it and you're wrong and so forth. And, but it's always good to, to get those who are honest and sincere. My sermon today is one I think that we need to think about and sometimes we all, I think, are easily to lose sight of it. When are sins really forgiven? When are sins really forgiven? Now I know that it's normally taught that when you accept the Lord, repent of your sins, that your sins are forgiven. And there are scriptures that seem to indicate that. But brother, we need to put the scriptures all together to get the complete picture. It's important to understand and to know when our sins are forgiven. Let's set a little bit of a foundation for our thoughts today. Let's turn to Romans, the fifth chapter. 
In Romans, the fifth chapter here, Paul goes back and explains where sin all began. It began with one man, Adam. And that's who he's talking about here. Adam is a subject in the chapter here. In the 19th verse, the, four, the, the first sentence, it says, For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. By one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So let's come back to verse 18, the first sentence. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men, to condemnation. Condemnation. Man, when he is born, he is condemned to death. So there is no time that we can say that man has no need of a Savior. We were born a sinner from the, from the standpoint of Adam's nature. We received his nature when we were born into this world. A sinner, as verse 19 says, then in verse 18 it says, unto condemnation. We're condemned, brethren, to die. And when the Bible speaks, not every time, no, I'll correct that, not every time, but when it speaks about the final death, it's speaking of the second death. Yes, the Bible says it's appointed to man wants to die. That is the death that we will all receive unless the Lord we're living when the Lord comes. But that second death is the death of condemnation. Unless we have our sins forgiven and we come and stand before the Lord blameless. That is why that on the day of Pentecost in Acts the second chapter in Acts the second Excuse me. In Acts the second chapter, as uh, Peter uh, stood before the people and explained to them what they had done to the Son of God, they hadn't realized that he was truly the Son of God. But as he preached to there to them, and now I'm sure he went back and he pointed out to them the prophecies that spoke about Christ being born, how he was born, where he was born, how he would grow up, how he would come forth in his ministry, how he would die, and how he would remain in the grave three days and three nights and come forth. And then he said, you crucified him, the Son of God. Then in the 37th verse, it says, Now when they heard this, when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. They were touched. They were hurt. They were pained, realizing that they had actually crucified the Son of God. They were pricked in their hearts and, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? How can we make things right? And Peter said unto them, Repent. Oh yes, brother, repentance is necessary. But we must understand what repentance is. We need to understand when our sins are forgiven. 
And if you'll permit me to say, brethren, lest I've also been guilty of leaving the wrong impression, having our sins forgiven is not just exactly that easy. Now you may wonder where I'm taking you this morning, but bear with me. Let us find out when are our sins actually forgiven. Yes, we are admonished to repent. And without repentance, there can be no relationship with God. Man must be born again. My friend that I hunt and fish with, in his early ministry, not a student, not ministry, but in his early study of the Bible, he was taught that the rebirth did not take place until after the resurrection. And to this day, he cannot fully grasp a new birth must take place now. He says that when you receive the new nature, that's when you're born again. Brethren, we're not born sons of God. If the rebirth does not take place now, why does the Bible call God's people sons of God? The rebirth takes place now, brethren. We must take on the nature of God. And we're not born with that. And all the time I've been talking, I've been trying to think of the word that he uses. And for the life of me, it slipped my mind. <clears throat> I guess I should have used him as an example if I couldn't remember the, the point at the end of it. The Bible says we must be born again. Born from above. Repent. That is the beginning of receiving the new life. In Romans the 10th chapter. In Romans the 10th chapter and the 9th verse. Paul says, but if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now here is a verse, if you just take it singly, all by itself, doesn't indicate anything about repentance. Just confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, Paul says you'll be saved. But we know there's more to it than that. That is why again we must study and put the complete picture together to understand wholly and completely the requirements that we must meet to have our sins forgiven. Yes, we must confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, that He is the Messiah, that He is the Christ, that He is the one that came and died on the cross 
We must confess that he died for me. But praise God, he rose again. He's ascended to heaven, and today he's my intercessor. Between me and my father. You could say he's my lawyer. <laughs> He's pleading my case. Saying, Father, I understand what Wes is going through. Forgive him. And thank God that he is our, our high priest, our intercessor. First John, the first chapter. First John, the first chapter. Oh, I, I, I haven't come across many, but nevertheless, I haven't come across some that just wonder if they can be forgiven. First John, the first chapter in the ninth verse, John says, if we confess our sins, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. John is giving us the assurance. See, Christ is not here. God is not here in person. But we can hear his voice and say, I forgive you. We must believe that on faith. But John is telling us, if we confess our sins, you can be assured that God will forgive you. There is nothing that you can do in this life that God will not forgive. Nothing, brother. I've only met perhaps only a couple in my ministry that says that God cannot forgive them. Thankfully, at least I want to believe that I was able to help them overcome that. Because I said, do you believe the word? Oh yes, I believe the word. And the Bible says he will forgive. He will forgive. You must believe that. So that peace can come. Brethren, before we can really have a relationship <laughs> with God, we must believe that he has forgiven us. We must believe that. But when does forgiveness come? When does it come? Just by words? Turn to Proverbs, the 28th chapter. Proverbs, the 28th chapter. And the thirteenth verse. He that covereth his sin shall never, shall not prosper. And brethren, this is not talking about financially. This is talking about spiritually. If we try to cover our sins, we'll never prosper in our relationship with God. We must be open. God knows everything about us. Why do we want to try to hide? Well, we can't hide. When a man tries to hide, he's seen his journey from his brother. But if we try to hide our sins from our, from our brother, and I'm not saying that we just go around and telling everybody what we've done. No, I'm not indicating that. But I am indicating if we try to cover up but not doing anything about it we'll never prosper a 
but my thought is we haven't come to the thought. But whosoever, whoso confesseth, notice now, and forsake. Amen. Forsake shall have mercy. Brethren, it doesn't do any good to ask forgiveness of God and turn around and continue in the sin. Forgiveness comes after we forsake sin. Not continuing. And that is important. Very important. Not only to ask God's forgiveness, but to forsake it and turn from it. Not to continue in the sea. He that confesseth and forsaketh them, the sins, he shall have mercy. God does not forgive if we're not willing to give sin up. If we're not willing to forsake sin, turn from it, and to live the life that God wants us to live. The scripture says, Be ye therefore holy as God is holy. And brethren, that is not a goal. That is something that must be done. Some people say that we cannot live a holy life. Well, if we can't live a holy life, then why does God ask us to live a holy life? Holiness does not seem like I'm always having to ex explain what I mean. Living a holy life does not mean that you cannot sin again. But we must be alert and strive not to sin again. But brethren, perfection and holiness is something that we must possess now. It's not a goal that you work toward. We just read a verse in 1 John that says if we confess he will forgive and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Brethren, we're holy. We're holy then. That is, if we turn away from sin. If we turn away from sin. Turn to 2 Chronicles, a verse that emphasizes it even stronger yet. 2 Chronicles, the seventh chapter, because God is talking about his people. 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14, it says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, now notice, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. See, he doesn't hear until we're willing to turn away. If they will seek my face, and humble themselves, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin. Brother, God will not forgive if we don't want to give up sin. If we continue to live in sin. Now that is important because that is something that is not preached today, brethren. I'm not talking about our church, I'm talking outside of the church. And we'll, we'll show that a little later on. God is emphasizing here that he will not forgive until we turn away. 
until we turn away from sin. This is emphasized again in the book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel, the 33rd chapter. Ezekiel 33. And verse 11. I say unto thee, as I live, saith the Lord God. Now this is God speaking through the prophet Ezekiel. As I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? Israel was God's people. And he says, turn ye, turn you from your evil ways. And you will not die. And you will not die. When is our sins forgiven, brother? It's when we turn away from them. Yes, we need to repent. We need to acknowledge to God, I have sinned, Father, and tell him about the sin. And how that you feel bad about it. David speaks about repentance. And he describes it as a a broken as a broken spirit. You know when you have when you're in deep sorrow, how you're broken up. You're sorry. You feel the sorrow, and so it is about sin. We're broken on the inside. God, I'm sorry. And that's why David describes true repentance is a broken spirit. Then we turn away from that scene. And it's forgiven. Praise God. It is forgiven. Now I've been talking about a lot about sin. And the Bible speaks is full of sin. My wife mentioned to me this morning that she was reading a, a pamphlet about a church and referring to the commandments of God and said we, we ought not to say they use the word not. The word not is negative. And I thought to myself, well, God, you don't understand English. You use the word not. And brother, I'm simple enough to believe that God says not, he means not. Thou shalt not. Yes, that is negative. But God wants us to understand what he's talking about and what he means. And if we try to lessen that, we're trying to water down God's word. Man tries to do that in other ways. Just to give you an example. We don't like to use the word drunk. He's an alcoholic. I, the brethren, the Bible says he's a drunk. I know that doesn't sound good. But sometimes we need to understand exactly how God means about things. And when he says not, he means not. 
Whether it is negative or not, he wants us to understand it is something he doesn't want us to do. What is sin? Since the Bible speaks so much about it, 1 John the third chapter. 1 John the third chapter and the fourth verse. And brethren, whether you realize it or not, this is the only verse in the Bible that really defines what sin is. There's other examples in the Bible, but this is the only true definition of what sin is. 1 John 3 and verse 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. Brethren, if we're transgressing the law of God, we're, we're sinning. Now, what's been the purpose of my sermon this morning? For us, to, to a great extent, yes. If I don't preach to myself, brethren, at the same time, but lost the real meaning of God's word. But it seems to me, to brethren, it seems to me today, God's people's feelings toward those who do not keep the commandments of God or Christians. Brethren, if God does not forgive sin until man turns away from sin, that means probably, and I'm just pulling a figure out of the air, 98% the Christian world sins has not been forgiven. So that's a pretty serious statement, brother. But if God plainly says, I will not forgive until you turn away from sin, even though the Christian world says, God, forgive me my sins, and yet they continue to Transgress the law of God could continue to live in sin. How can we say then that God has forgiven them of their sin? I'm trying to put it down more narrow, brethren, from sermon. To sermon to let us realize the Bible says there's only one road, the straight and the narrow path. And brethren, we cannot get away from that. Only one road that leads to the kingdom of God. It is those who keep the commandments of God and the faith and have the faith of Jesus Christ. Amen. Those are the ones who are on the straight and the narrow road. And if I understand my Bible correctly, those who do not and are not obeying the Lord have not had Sins forgiveness. Where can we go then? Brother, there's nowhere else we can go. That's why Peter told the <laughs> Lord when the Lord said, Where will you go? And Peter says, There's nowhere else. Jesus said, will you go, go away too? Because he had told, made a remark that most of his followers just could not accept. I'm depending on my memory, but I believe he said, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you have no part with me. 
And many of his followers went away from following him after that. And Jesus turned to his disciples. He says, will you leave too? And Peter says, Lord, where will we go? Where can we go? Thou hast the words of life. That's why, brethren, I speak these sermons from time to time as I do to let us know that there's only one path. There's only one path. Seeing is a transgression of God's law. It doesn't make any difference by saying, God, forgive me, then turn around and continue to transgress God's law. God cannot forgive a sin that we're not willing to give up. He cannot forgive a sin that we want to hold on to. It's only when we forsake it and leave it behind. Then he forgives. Second Peter, the third chapter. My closing text for today. Second Peter, the third chapter. And the 14th verse, Peter says, Wherefore, beloved, see that you look for such things. And in other words, he's referring to you go back. And he's speaking about the day of the Lord and uh, how it's going to be like the new kingdom. Then in verse 14, he says, Wherefore, beloved, see that you look for such things. Be diligent. That she may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. And blameless. We need to be at peace with God. And we need to stand before him without spot and blameless. And that's why, brethren, I admonish myself, all of us this morning, to understand that God not only expects, but He demands obedience. There's no other way. I wish I could say, well, when I say I wish I, I, I hope you mean, understand what I mean. When I say I wish I could say there was some other way, but I can't. I'm, I'm in a position that's Balaam. You know Balaam, he, he wanted the prize, the reward, the king was going to give him if he would just curse Israel. He offered Balaam a great amount of money and prestige if he would curse Balaam. And, and Balaam went out on the hillside and apparently he was going to do it. He looked out over into Israel and nothing came out. But nothing came out. And I get the impression that he did that not just one day, but another day or two, and he still couldn't utter anything. Finally, he told the king, he said, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord. <laughs> I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord. And brother, I can I do if the Bible says that there's only one path, the straight and the narrow, I cannot preach anything else. And we need to be reminded of that lest we begin to think outside of the written word. Oh, I have many friends who are not Believers, as you and I believe, are good people, are lovable people. I love to be around them. But 
my income, income tax is made. Man, I would just love to see you converted to become a part of the church of God. He's a lovable man. But he's not ready for the kingdom. He's not ready for the kingdom. How can I go beyond the word of God? The word of God is sharp as a two-edged sword. Brethren, may God be with us and help us as we continue to think on these things. If we really want and feel that our sins have been forgiven, and we can, praise God for that. God's forgiveness only comes after we forsake sin. He will forgive. Praise God.